dancing his way into a potential third indictment, but once again, it looks like water off the Donald's back. Yesterday, Donald Trump announced that he was told that a grand jury would be investigating his efforts to overturn the 2020 election result, culminating in the storming of the Capitol on January the 6th, 2021. Earlier this year, Trump was indicted on 34 counts in relation to hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels and 37 counts for his handling of classified documents in his Mar-a-Lago estate. Just as he did with his previous indictments, Trump strongly denied all accusations, calling it a witch hunt and doubling down on his stolen election claims. But whilst most politicians would be crippled by just one of these scandals, Trump has utilised them to his benefit, claiming to be a victim of the establishment. And it's seemingly working, with more than half of Republican voters saying they support him to be on the ticket for the 2024 election, whilst his nearest rival, Ron DeSantis, is plummeting in public opinion, going from neck and neck with Trump to around 30 points behind within four months. But should the two current, as well as potential third indictment, make Trump ineligible for the presidency? Is there anyone or anything that can stop Trump? Should the Democrats open up their primaries, or is Biden capable of defeating Trump once again? What's next for Donald Trump? All right, let's get to it. What is next for Donald Trump? As always, we begin with a quick fire round. 30 seconds each to lay out your initial stance on the matter, and now we pick it up uh, from there. Eagle Marcus, please take the lead. Your 30 seconds are on. You know, you, before your break, you called Donald Trump a hurricane. I would call him a lightning rod. The reality is that the more the lightning strikes, electricity can absolutely spread. And the more lightning strikes Donald Trump, it seems like the base is getting fired up. So beware what you wish for. At the end of the day, Republicans are sick and tired of this political prosecution. They are being fired up. They are coming out. And whether you like Donald Trump or not, he is the uh, the lead right now, and will stay that way until Democrats realize that political prosecutions are not something Americans want anymore. Okay, Gabrielle uh, Groisman, your thoughts. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. Look, there's two things can be true at the same time. First, mm -hmm. uh, Trump obviously was sloppy in many of the ways he, he dealt with things. Mm -hmm. um, that's true. Uh, it's also true that this is clearly a political prosecution, just like the last two cases were. The intention is to try to derail um, Donald Trump's um, attempts to get back into the White House, as you've seen and as you noted, that's not the case. It's not that as of now, it has not hurt him at all. Will it ultimately hurt him? That is the question. Uh, the race is much closer than it seems uh, because we don't have national polls. But these cases, everybody sees them for what they are, even the Democrats. And it's a political prosecution. Last but not least, Rata Morg, uh, your take. Of course, the major challenge for the GOP right now is to decide whether or not they're going to rally up a, another Republican candidate, fearing that electing Trump as the nominee might cause them the general election, or if they wouldn't be able to rally around a single candidate besides Trump, whether they're risking, uh, willing to take the risk that his candidacy for the third time in a row might cost them the White House. Okay, and on that note, uh, gentlemen, let's uh, please feel free to interact from this point uh, onwards to engage in a conversation. So uh, we do need to ask um, if and when, uh, if or when, is a January 6th uh, indictment different than all others or, or is it more, more of the same, uh, Gabriel? It's too early to tell. Everybody's jumping to try to comment on this. What we have is a letter that was sent uh, by the prosecutors to Donald Trump asking him to come um, testify or give him the opportunity to testify in front of a grand jury. No one really knows exactly what's in the potential indictment. In fact, there is no indictment yet. Um, so is it different? Yes, because January 6th riles up the Democrats more than anything else. Is it different from a legal perspective? I doubt it. Eagle, uh, is Trump fit to serve? It's up to the American people. They're going to vote for it because we live in a great mm -hmm. democracy. But I'll tell you one thing, and this is very important to something that uh, one, of the, one of the other guests mentioned a minute mm -hmm. ago. If there's something Republicans love more than anything else, it's our country and the Constitution of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And when you take an institution like the Department of Justice or the military and you politicize it and you infuse it with wokeness, Republicans hate that. 
And at this point, we're going to put up the person who is uh, who is absolutely able to bring out the crowds, bring out the voters, and stop this uh, this movement, which is very dangerous for our country. Gautam, what do you think? It comes down to the question whether or not the Republicans are willing to take the risk by nominating Trump for the third time in a row. But I think that beyond that, the question is not necessarily whether or not he's legally fit to run, because obviously the Constitution says that he does. It's about whether or not those indictments would provide enough ammunition to the Democrats. Mm. And from what I've seen currently, that specific um, that specific indictment might not uh, turn the tables. When it looks to the swing votes in the United States, anything that has to do with the uh, indictment around the classified materials in Mar-a-Lago, that seems to be more touching the nerves of the average American because classified information, intelligence briefings, information about movement of troops or, God forbid, nuclear weapons, these are things that are much more at the hard core and as close to consensus as possible in today's American politics compared to the January 6th, which is way more controversial. Um, you know, uh, I'll tell you what's actually... I'll tell you what's actually... Respectfully, respectfully, respectfully the... Uh, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Respectfully, the actually, documents... Actually, i got to tell you, in terms of voters... The needle, did not move the needle at all. The, the documents case did not move the needle at all. And I want to tell you the most interesting part of this whole thing. The most interesting part is the following. Many Republican primary voters are not uh, Donald Trump supporters. In fact, a majority of them are not, if you look at the numbers, mm -hmm. uh, in, but including maybe myself. But here we are on television all over the world talking about Donald Trump and finding ourselves in a position where we have to defend Donald Trump mm. if we want to be intellectually honest, because these cases are just ridiculous. And we, are, we have to be intellectually honest, and that the conversation then becomes a conversation about Donald Trump. And this is an Israeli TV mm -hmm. channel, so we don't have to look too far to see what happens when political opponents bring shoddy cases that are not really supported by the facts. They don't accomplish what they're meant to accomplish. In fact, the opposite happens. You know what? I'll tell you what voters also kind of hate. They actually kind of hate when a vice president of the United States sells his seat uh, to the Chinese and to the Ukrainians and uh, absolutely engages in uh, in a crime-filled career as a vice president. Got to tell you, when the Department of Justice even refuses to appoint a special counsel against the, the current president of the United States, when the evidence, including hearings that are occurring as we speak right now in the House, with the whistleblowers coming forward with clear and convincing evidence that this has been an absolute cover-up by the Department of Justice, I got to tell you, Americans take that a lot more than what's in the boxes in a, in a storage uh, room in, in Mar-a-Lago. Americans care about the integrity of our constitution, of our country, of our politic, and of course, the presidency. That's under fire right now. It's got to change. And that's the reason why President, former President Donald Trump is rising. He's a lightning rod and mm -hmm. the electricity is spreading like crazy. Beware what you guys wish for because you fire up the, the Republicans, we're going to come out in, in droves when it comes to the uh, to the upcoming elections and primary season. Well, well yet another By reference to Israeli politics, if you will, uh, coming in droves. And, and you know what? Speaking of which, let's stay with the uh, Israeli politics motif here. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a different uh, uh, mechanism here, a parliamentary system. But yet there is this notion of a strategic vote to vote from your heart or vote from your mind. And um, paraphrasing uh, to or alternating it uh, to the American system, should Republicans Republicans vote uh, for the for their favorable candidate or for the candidate that will make Democrats sweat. They should vote for the candidate that's the, that's going to win. At the end of the day, this is a zero sum game in the primaries. You have to vote for the candidate who can win. The the numbers actually show Ron DeSantis having the strongest chance in the field in the in the in the general election, not Donald Trump. That's why you're seeing so much pressure getting Trump forward. Mm -hmm. uh, people can be thankful for things Trump did in his former presidency, but we can also say that it's time to move on and to have fresh blood in politics. And, and there are other candidates that accomplish that. So, Autumn, mm -hmm. if we're looking at it from the I Democratic uh, standpoint, uh, it's good that Republicans will vote Trump. Trump. Well, I'm an Israeli citizen. I'm not taking a stand on 
domestic American politics, and I would never tell anyone whomever to vote or not to vote. I would say that it's very hard to be a good president, whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you're not elected president. So my personal philosophy is vote for the electable candidate, whomever you are on whatever party you are, vote for whomever you think can defeat your rival. Ego Marcus. I think, yeah, I, I think what people are overlooking here is the fact that you got a lot of serious issues facing the United States of America right now on every front. Mm -hmm. And we need solutions and policies that are going to turn America around and let it rise once again. Now, every time we talk about an indictment, it's a distraction. We don't want to talk about lawsuits and arrests and prosecutions, certainly not political prosecutions. What I'd rather talk about is our economy, our foreign policy, a border that's porous, a drug problem, a deficit that is exploding. These are the issues that require focus. These are the issues that Americans care about. Middle America are going to come out to the to the candidate that can solve these problems and talk about these issues. Let's get past the lawsuits, past the political prosecutions, and if the Democrats have any courage, they're going to allow us to have an election about the policies and not about the personalities. But, but uh, Gabriel, even in, in this respect, in, in respect of the issues and the internal Republican uh, debate, and you know what, speaking of debate, should, should Trump attend an RNC uh, debate? Does he have more to lose if, if, he, if he is going to show up, maybe? If, if he's a serious candidate, he needs to show up. It's August 23rd in Milwaukee. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to be there. He needs to be there. He needs to stop playing games. He needs to stop saying, you know, mm -hmm. the, the debate requires you to confirm that you will support whoever the nominee is in a general election. And he's playing around with that and playing around with whether or not he'll show up. He needs to be there. The American voters need to see the difference between him and the other candidates so they can make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got to say that I, I mean, again, not on a personal basis, but mm -hmm. I can definitely make the claim for President Trump, former President Trump, for not to make it to the stage. Uh, standing in the same position and on the same status with his rivals, some of them have single digit support, just makes him look bad and makes them look good. And it would put him on the defense. And strategically, that's not necessarily where he wants to be. Miguel Marcus, how will it reflect on him among Republicans? I'm going to take a different a different approach to this, and I'm going to say that he can stay home, not a problem. And the reason for that is because I think Americans want to actually refocus here on the policies, uh, and right now he wants to distract with the uh, the controversies. Americans want to move past that. We want a lot of people out there. Again, I always ask the question: If he was such a popular president that he and 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 the, and the, the position is his, why are only 50% of Republicans voting for him? He should have a 95% approval rating. He should have a 95% of Republicans voting for him. We want to move on. We want to move on. And having him not there will actually allow. Yeah. The debate to focus on the policies and not the personalities. Yeah. And that's key to the, well, to the next president. Is the GOP uh, past Trumpism, if you will? The answer seems to be no. Uh, gentlemen, we're taking a quick break, but we'll be right back with a part two of our summit, so do not go anywhere. Welcome back to the summit. Still with us, Eagle Marcus, uh, Gabriela Grossman, and Rotem uh, Org. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for staying with us. We're also staying on topic, of course, but before we get back uh, to our conversation, let's hear him. Uh, let's hear it, rather, from uh, the man of the hour himself. Here's Donald Trump's uh, remarks uh, last night uh, from uh, the town hall I uh, had. Uh, let's take a listen. You released on Truth Social earlier today that they now, that you are a target of this January 6th grand jury. It doesn't seem to bother you like I think it would bother so many other people. What, what is it about you that it doesn't? No, it bothers me. It bothers me for everybody in this incredible sold out audience. And it's, uh, it bothers you. I got the letter on Sunday night, think of it. I don't think they've ever sent a letter on Sunday night. And they're in a rush because they want to interfere. It's interference with the election. It's election interference. Never been done like this in the history of our country, and it's a disgrace. What's happening to our country, whether it's the borders or the elections or kinds of things like this, where the DOJ has become a weapon for the Democrats. Okay, gentlemen. 
gentlemen, we got back uh, from the break uh, with two out of three. Good stats here. Uh, Eagle and uh, Rotom, you're still with us. Uh, Gabriel uh, will be joining us soon. Let's uh, kickstart another quick fire round. Have government uh, organizations uh, simply become too politicized? Uh, Rotom, your 30 seconds are on. What's your take? They have become more politicized because we live in an era in which Everything is more politicized. Uh, questions of science and health and climate are politicized. So it only makes sense that organizations and procedures that are not involved with science but with people like government organizations are more politicized. However, if a government institution believes that there is some evidence to a foul play, they need to launch an investigation. If nothing happened, that's okay, and they'll find out and they'll clear the name. But if they believe there's evidence, they yeah. should question that, definitely. Well, who will guard the guards, right? Uh, Eagle Marcus, your thoughts? Yeah, of course they have. When, when you get a National Defense Authorization Act that's full of woke policies uh, that the Republicans want to remove, when you have a Department of Justice that is selectively choosing who to prosecute, uh, this is not about prosecution. It's about selective prosecution, where one side gets that's not in power gets prosecuted, the other side doesn't. When you have the National Education Association uh, and, and other Department of Education completely politicized and pushing woke policies, yeah, but I don't buy the fact that this has always been that way and that we're any particularly more political than we were in the past we just it's just stinging a lot more and it's got to stop yeah the times are changing but not uh, that much uh, you're saying uh, gabriel uh, grossman uh, wrap it up for us the quick fire round have government organizations simply become too politicized your 30 seconds are on the, the answer is clearly yes they become too politicized and is it worse now than before you know, let the historians decide that. But the reality is that perception is reality. And public mm -hmm. perception in the United States across political, uh, across the political aisle, across the political spectrum uh, is in agreement that there, everything has been politicized, our institutions have been politicized, and the trustworthiness of Congress, of the courts, of the Department of Justice, of the FBI, um, and sometimes of local police departments in some cases, um, is being eroded, and that is very dangerous uh, for our country. Well, uh, gentlemen, uh, I do want us uh, to shift focus uh, just a tiny bit because there is another um, uh, momentous event uh, today on Capitol uh, Hill that is uh, the address of the Israeli uh, president mm -hmm. that uh, wrapped up a uh, short uh, while ago, uh, which brings brings me uh, to ask uh, this, uh, Trump, DeSantis slamming, is Biden's treatment uh, of Israel turning it uh, fully red, Eagle? <laughs> it's outrageous. Uh, Israel is heavily red anyway, but uh, absolutely. Uh, the way that this president has treated Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is on any level uh, terrible. And the reality is that uh, we have a lot of complexities here in this country and in this region that require an engaged president and an engaged prime minister and a, a match to have people speaking to each other when he so overtly uh, that turns BB away and, and refuses to engage with him and, and, and treat him like the like the ally that he claims he is. Uh, it's wrong, and so yeah, it, Israelis. From what I'm talking, the people that I'm talking to are uh, both sides of the, of the aisle are absolutely outraged by this. Uh, again, this clear anti-Israel stance that he has uh, as a, a continuation from from the prior from the Obama administration uh, before. So. It's pe people are pretty upset about it, and they have every right to be. Gabriel, what do you think? It was just four years ago or so where I was sitting in the halls of Congress listening to Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu addressing a joint session of Congress on Iran. You won't believe uh, it. Eight years, Russia. Gabriel. Eight years. Hmm. Eight years. Well, so eight years. <laughs> eight years ago, uh, the, the the fact the fact that the, that President Herzog was there, who did a fine job, but the fact that he was there is a clear snub to Prime Minister Netanyahu. I know that the Israeli uh, diplomatic establishment doesn't want to come out with that message. Everyone is being very celebratory, but this is the, everyone knows is the problem. You're showing the images of this supposedly cozy relationship. Now they're negotiating whether or not to meet in a side room in the United Nations in New York rather than uh, to welcome him in the in the. White House. It's not just symbolic, it's indicative of uh, real issues with the White House and Israel. Luckily, that issue is not permeating in Congress. We saw Congress pass yeah. almost unanimously, only with nine mm -hmm. people voting no to support Israel mm -hmm. just today as well. Um, mm -hmm. So luckily, it's something that's that's uh, focused in the White House. 
but we have to make sure to work to make sure that that doesn't spread throughout American politics. And yet, Rotem, uh, Trump mm -hmm. also uh, somewhat turning against Netanyahu. Uh, um, uh, can the U.S.-Israel relationship go um, get, get back on, on track as long uh, as Netanyahu is at the helm? Well, it really depends on the Israeli policy. What I'm concerned about is that Israel is slightly becoming a partisan issue in the United States. And while we maintain a good relationship with the GOP, and some people might say too good of a relationship with the GOP, we are slightly, slowly, but steadily losing the Democratic Party. And Biden's policies are still quite supportive of Israel. Um, it may be controversial, but he hasn't done anything to damage Israel's security or to abandon it. And as you've just said, in Congress, we've just saw a reaffirmation of the uh, US general support of Israel. Yeah. But the long-term trends are challenging. And there's a major question, what will Israel do to make sure that Republican or Democrat, conservative or, or liberal, it is the American thing to do to support Israel. So, so, so it, well, I, can I? Please, Eagle. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, America is a great democracy, and the people mm -hmm. got to vote the, the, the government in and, and vote for House of Representatives in the Senate presidency. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the people are voting in members of Congress who are overtly anti Israel. And that is a trend on the left that we can't be blind to. And instead of powwowing to them and capitulating to them, we have to stand up for our principles and say, this is who we are. We're very proud. We've got to we've accomplished mm -hmm. great things. And you have, to, you have to accept that or you have to live with that. Uh, but the reality is that when you look at, the, as an example, uh, AOC and her, mm -hmm. uh, her group of, of anti-Israel, <laughs> uh, you know. The squad. At the yeah. end of the day. The squad, right. I mean, when, when they won't even show up for a speech by an apolitical leader, apolitical leader of, uh, of, of Israel, you got to wonder whether it's the voters that we have to be concerned about and not necessarily the politicians. The politicians reflect the voters and... And yet, seems to have yeah. and yet, I'm interested we, we, about the relationship we, between the two, because, as you've said, nine members of Congress voted against that resolution and some of them boycotted President Herzog's speech. But over 200 or close to 200 Democratic members of the House supported that resolution, attended the speech, tweeted about that. My question is not about the yeah, current to, situation. Recall, My question is about the future. What do we do to make sure that this group of nine, you've called them anti-Israel Congress people, would not become 19? That's our mission. Yeah, they're, they're, they're closer to 16, and, and they're not just anti-Israel. They're clearly anti-Semitic members of Congress. They've showed it time and time again. A resolution is not binding. It doesn't do anything. It's just a hat tip to, keep, to get people off of their backs. We have an issue that runs very deep in the United States and the Democratic side. Uh, Democrats under the age of 30 are... are the majority of them are anti-Israel, and those are the people that are working as staff members for members yeah. of Congress, for members of Senate, and in the White House. That's a problem we have to work on. As well, American gentlemen, Jews, perhaps uh, only for I'm tonight. Only for tonight, we will choose to see the glass half full, uh, 200 and uh, something, um, voicing different uh, outlook. Hey, I see you liked it. Want more? Just hit the subscribe button right here. Go on. I know you want to.